that's what we kind of go with. Anything else? Another characteristic of a short story. Okay, there are characters. It's this idea, guys, where we are going to be focusing um, today, and really for the next, shall we say, six weeks or so. We're going to move into our short story unit. In the short story unit, we're going to be learning about a lot of different things, and we're going to start moving into what's called literary elements. That is, the things that a, a, an author puts into the story to make it what it is. But for today, if we're going to be doing a short story unit, we're going to be able to say that we can identify the characteristics of a short story um, and that we can define the term in and of itself. So we're going to start with a um, grammar mini lesson. New unit, we have new grammar that we're going to be taking care of. Take a look up here. We're going to be talking about dependent and independent clauses. Anybody heard of these before? Say what? 14. Let me ask you this. The words dependent and independent. Yvonne Trey, if I say dependent, not a dependent clause, but just dependent, what does it mean, that, that word dependent? Speaking, what does dependent mean? You depend on something. Okay, it depends on something. It means something else. Fine. All right. So it depends on something else. I absolutely agree. So when we go to that word independent, Jerome, what do you think independent means? Like you don't need nobody's help. You don't need anything, you don't need the help of anything or anybody else. So when we talk about clauses, we're talking about a clause that needs something else and a clause that doesn't need something else. So, independent clause. We're gonna start with independent clause today. And I would say these are probably a couple notes that you should take down. You have to go really close. That's fine. Mm -hmm. An independent clause, and I would only write down the first bullet right here. An independent clause is a series of words that contain both a subject and an action. And I'm going to actually add something to this. Have a um, subject, an action, and expresses a complete thought. I will write that as well. Subject, an action, and expresses a complete thought. something that has a subject, an action, and a complete thought. You guys have actually learned this before. What does this sound like the definition of? I'm saying go back to maybe second grade, third grade. A sentence that has... No? Has a subject, an action, and a complete thought. I'll give you the second word. Second word is sentence. Short sentence. Complete sentence. Complete sentence. An independent clause is a complete sentence. You've learned this before. The 
reason we still we call it an independent clause instead of a complete sentence is because while well, complete sentence and independent clause are the same thing, when we start talking about independent, or sorry, dependent clauses, you're going to need to know the difference. So it's one of those where you just have to know both terms. So an independent clause, it's a series of words that contain a subject, an action, and expresses a complete thought, also known as a complete sentence. Do me a favor, guys. Take a look at this paper here. It says exercise one. Examples here. Is this an independent clause? Yeah. Yeah. Alicia's wrist began to hurt. Yes. No. Yes. I got a yes, I got a no, I got a yes and a no from the same person. Yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think this is an independent clause, if this is a sentence that expresses a complete thought, has a subject and an action. Raise your hand if you think it's not independent, a.k.a. not a complete sentence. Raise your hand if you don't know. Okay. Well, let's go through it. it needs a subject, a verb, and a complete thought. Alicia's wrist began to hurt. Let's find the action first. Christina, what's the action here? Christina, what's the action? Hold on. Technically, it is began. However, let's just get the complete action. It began to what? Hurt. Okay. Began to hurt. That's the action. So what are we going to call the subject? What is performing that action? The wrist. The wrist. Okay. So we got an action. We got a subject. Does this express a complete thought? Yes. So is this an independent clause? Yes. Absolutely. Let's look at another one. JoJo's mom went to the hospital for a broken wrist. Is this independent? Yes. Ben, do me a favor. What's the verb here? What's the action? Um, Say it again. Yes. Went. Absolutely. Okay. Went. Stephen, who or what is doing the going or the went? Mom. Okay. Listen for the name I asked. Stephen. Jojo. Jojo's going? He said Jojo's mom. Jojo's mom. In this case, the actual subject would be mom. But yes, JoJo's mom is going to the hospital. So the next question becomes, we have a subject, we have a verb, do we have a complete thought? JoJo's mom went to the hospital for a broken wrist. Yep. Independent clause. In the following sentence, which one or which part is the independent clause? There are two parts to the sentence. Which one is the independent clause? Sentence says, before playing in the game, Raul remembered that his wrist had been hurting for some time. The second one is independent. If I told you that the sentence was broken up at the comma, raise your hand if you think the first part from before to game is the independent. Raul to time. I would agree. It's Raul to time. Okay. And tomorrow, when we talk about dependent clauses, guess what this part's called? Dependent, dependent clause. Okay. So, for you, going back to that worksheet that I had you go to a second ago, there are eight on here. And for the sake of time, let's go ahead and just go through four, one through four. What I want you to do is identify the part of each sentence that is not independent. And for one of them, and you can choose as a group. For one of them, I'd like you to turn it into an independent clause. So you identify the incomplete sentence or the dependent clause. And for one of them, turn it into an independent. What are we writing here? Right on the paper. I mean, like, how do we turn it to a How do you post Hold on. Ben, you just write it? Up? Just write it right on the back. Is that OK? Yeah. OK. I'm going to post the it. It's If I said turn the incomplete sentence into a complete sentence. Can you do that? Same idea. 
that snatch very good. And that See, even who or what's doing the snatching? Oh, I wanted to just keep going. Mm -hmm. Santana. 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 Okay. Does this express a complete thought? Yes. yes. Marcel, would you like close? Yeah. Nicole. All right, so that one's good. We get to the third one. As baked beans and potato salad slid into Maria's new sandals. Monica, what is the action of this part? Slid, good. And we know that the subject, baked beans and potato salad, those are the two things sliding. However, is this a complete thought? No. It's not. When we say, as the baked beans and potato salad slid into Maria's new sandal, What's that happen? we need something else. So we know that C is the non-independent clause. So, all right, ladies and gentlemen, raise your hand on number two if you think A is the non-independent. Raise your hand if it's B. C. Oh, wait, what? Number one? Number two. Number two? It's A. Okay. In this case, it is A. Let's look why. Let's look why. If we say, ever since Andre peaked at Alyssa's paper during the biology exam, what do we want to know? Why did he do it? Why? What happened? What was the results? When did he do it? When did he do it? Why? This isn't a complete thought. It's not a complete thought. Number three. Oh, wait. Number three. James opened the door of his cluttered refrigerator, which caused a pint of blueberries to fall to the floor. The fruit bounced and rolled everywhere in an explosion of indigo. It's indigo type of It's type of okay. Raise your hand if you think it's A. I don't know. I like the word Raise your hand if you think it's B. C. In this case, it is B. Z, I was talking about don't fit B. Now, let me show you something. If. If I took out this period right here, I put a comma, then it becomes a complete thought. James opened the door of his cluttered refrigerator, which caused the pint of blueberries to fall to the floor. It caused it. So. That becomes a complete thought. But as it's written, with which being a new sentence, it is not independent. We're going to continue to work with these over the next couple days. Okay, but I do suggest that you start working on these on your own to make sure you understand the difference. So, that's housekeeping part one. Housekeeping part two. We're going to be starting to do more writing. Uh, yeah, that's our ED. We're going to start to do more writing. <laughs> part of the reason we're going to be doing that is one, it's English class. Second reason we're going to do it is because writing is a vital skill in the real world. Number three, and more important in the short term, is that when we get to the end of this year, you are going to have two on-demand tests. I know on-demand tests. This is when they give you a subject and you have to write about it. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So, the formatting <laughs> will be S-R-E-E. -E. How many of you have ever heard of this? S-R-E-E, -E, that spells three. Okay, here's the fun fact. Some of you may have learned about SRE in middle apart. school. Okay, that That's second E hard. is mine. I came up with it. No, okay? Right. And the reason that I came up with it is I found a lot of students didn't know how to analyze, which makes sense. Analysis is hard. And the second E helps you with analysis. So if you look at the board, SREE -E stands for statement, reason, evidence, and explanation. Statement, reason, evidence, and explanation. So, you have a green sheet here. Take a look. Green sheet. You guys need to hold on to this. You need to keep this. This needs to stay in a place that you won't lose it. It is your tip sheet. 
Please notice that under the second E, I give you two questions. You need to memorize those two questions. Because every time you do a second E, you're going to answer those two questions. So the first one is, what does the evidence do or show? When you provide me text evidence, what does it do or show? And then you are going to tell me, how does that answer the question? How does that actually answer the question? So do me a favor, read along with me at the bottom of this paper. This is an example SREE paragraph. One element that shows the character's motivation is imagery. That's the S. It's where I'm telling you and stating what this is about. The reason imagery shows motivation is by allowing the reader to form a mental image. So I tell you, I give you the reason why the author would want to use that piece of evidence. For example, the text says, Jimmy's anger was like a boiling part pot of water. It got closer and closer to the edge before it finally boiled over. That's, That's the evidence. I take it directly from the text. Directly from the text. This quote shows an image of water that represents Jimmy's anger. So that answers the question, what does the evidence do or show? It shows the character's motivation by allowing the reader to understand how the character's anger grew until finally Jimmy exploded. And that answers the question, how does that answer the question? That's where you go back to the prompt. Did you write that? I wrote that. That's really good. This, ladies and gentlemen, is two plus three range. This is bare minimum. What's four? To get a four on an SRE paragraph, that second E needs to go deeper. It's that second question. How does it answer the question? That's where you have to do more explanation, more analysis to get closer to that four. But this is bare bones. Pretty much every exit slip this week, we are doing SREE. And guess what's going to be on your test on uh, Friday? Because we're not okay. testing Friday, but we will test Monday. SREE. It will be SREE. Three. That's called three. Three. All right. So transitioning one more time. We're going to talk about the characteristics of a short story. You also have a yellow piece of paper. Yellow piece of paper. Do me a favor, guys. Look at short story terminology. It's the uh, side that has more terms on it. It's the side that looks like this. What I'd like you to do is take 20 seconds. What do you notice about the characteristics of a short story? They're short. They're short. No, look here. Look here. 20 seconds on your own. Which style are you looking at? We're going back. Okay, raising of hands, please. What do we notice about the characteristics of a short story then? Um, has a climax. Okay, has a climax. Raising of hands, please. What else? Jerome? It's like a, it's like a regular story. No. What's the word we, we use for that regular story? Novel. Novel, thank you. Like Raising of hands, give me something else. Yvette? Mm -hmm. Right. That's what I'm getting at. If we see the second question, what is the similarities to a novel, what's different? Essentially what we find is that the terminology is more or less the same. The only thing that's different, the only thing that's different is number one, it's shorter. And number two, we tend to use a few more uh, pieces of figurative language, of imagery, things like that. And we're going to get into that. What do you think you should do with this yellow sheet? Keep it. Keep it. That's why I put it on colored paper. Okay. Take a look at this three minute video. Three minutes, that's wrong. That will help explain the elements of a short story. Now all eyes up here, please. All eyes. Oh. Check it out, yo. Oh. Yeah. Okay. 
setting That's like where it's going down Could be the twin compartment, a castle or a town Could be the Arctic winter light to build a fire The temperature's dropping, excitement's getting higher Setting sets the scene so we soon seem set Could be an Italian restaurant where we met Setting gives us the where and the when Could be modern day, the future, or way back when Character, conflict, themes, setting Yes, these are the five things that you're gonna be needing when you're reading or writing a short story that's mad exciting. Character, conflict, themes, setting. Yes, these are the five things that you're gonna be needing when you're reading or writing a short story that's mad exciting. Is the action, the quest for satisfaction. What's going down? What's going to happen? Four men to see in an open boat, rowing and hoping that they can stay afloat. The plot they had to make it to the beach, but the waves are big and the shore seems out of reach. Plot is a series of events like Lemony Snicket. It could be crazy, wild, or straight wicked. Plot, character, conflict, theme, setting. Yes, these are the five things that you're gonna be needing when you're reading or writing a short story that's mad exciting. Plot, character, conflict, theme, setting. Yes, these are the five things. of people in the story who carry out the action. Characters can be pretty tiny and clean. Characters can be silly, whiny, or mean. Juliet is a character, and so is Romeo. Pokemon has characters, and so does Yu-Gi-Oh. Characters can be dogs, lions, and hippos. J.K. Rowling tells Harry Potter. Who oh, no. knows? Character, conflict, theme, setting. Yes, these are the five things that you're going to be needing when you're reading or writing a short story that's mad exciting. Like some robbers and cops could be an internal conflict to struggle inside. Like, I don't want to tell the truth, but I don't ever want to lie. Click something in your eye, now you're conflicted. What created drama? Conflict is. Character, conflict, theme, setting. Yes, these are the five things that you're going to be needing when you're reading or writing a short story that's mad exciting. Character, conflict, theme, setting. Yes, these are the five things that you're going to be needing when you're reading or writing. Short story that's mad exciting. The theme of the story is the main idea, the central belief, or the topic that's in there. It's usually something abstract, like sacrifice, isolation, and resurrection. We back to life, like don't lie, don't practice libel. The theme of to build a fire is survival. Survivor on your own, like five of us. What? Vocabulary, something that you have to get. Character, conflict, theme, setting. Yes, these are the five things that you're gonna be needing when you're reading. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, that when we talk about short story, okay, we've heard of plot, we've heard of character, we've heard of setting, we've heard of conflict. Theme is the new one. It's the one that we're really going to be diving into for the next, definitely for this week. Okay, we're going to spend about three days on theme this week. But theme is going to be recurrent, meaning we're going to come back to it as well. So. Here's how the next few that. weeks are going to work. We are actually going to be focusing on one short story a week. What's that? What's that? What's, what's the short story this week? The short story this week is what's actually in your packet. Okay. The white okay. It's called Harrison Bergeron. So, Harrison Bergeron is written by a guy named Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Kurt Vonnegut Jr. is very well known for writing dystopian stories. Does anybody know what dystopian means? Disoriented. Not disorienting. No. Dystopian. How about this? Does anybody know what the word, word utopia means? Ooh, perfect society. Perfect society. So if I say dystopian, it's right written about imperfect society. However, in dystopian stories, excuse me, 
what we tend to see are stories where people try to make a perfect society and instead broke it. How many of you have seen or read The Hunger Games? Ooh. Dystopian. Oh, that's way dystopian. Okay. Yeah. So, we are going to read um, this first page. We're only going to do the first page today. And as we read, I'm going to ra ta ta about the first half. And we are going to be looking for um, elements of a short story. We're looking for elements of a short story. When you guys begin to read, um, you are going to continue looking for those, and your exit slip is going to be written in the form of what do you think? S-R-E. S-R-E-E. Okay? So, I'd like everybody to please follow along. We're going to annotate together. We're going to annotate together, and we're looking for elements of a short story. Here we go. Wait, is this everybody to not be talking and looking at your papers, please. Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. The year was 2081, and everybody was finally equal. They weren't only equal before God and the law. They were equal every which way. So I'm going to circle this word equal. And I'm going to put this word conflict with a question mark. Now, I don't, you know, normally we don't think equality is a, a conflict. But when this, for me, as I read this, I say, okay, they weren't only equal before God, they were equal in every way. This tells me, especially with my knowledge of Kurt Vonnegut, something's going to happen as a result of this. So let's go ahead and continue. Nobody was smarter than anybody else, nobody was better looking than anybody else. Nobody was stronger or quicker than anybody else. All this equality was due to the 211th, 212th, and 213th Amendments to the Constitution and to the unceasing vigilance of agents of the United States Handicapper General. So I'm going to underline United States Handicapper General, and I'm going to circle Handicapper. handicapper. Now, we know what it means to be handicapped. What's that mean? Disabled? Is disabled. disabled in some way. So if, I, if somebody's a handicapper, that is a person who does what? Disabled. Makes people handicapped. So I'm going to look at this. Do you put another word here? Conflict? Yeah, that's mean. I'm going to write conflict, and I'm also going to write character. That's mean. I like to do it Let's continue. Wait, what'd you say? Would you put character in what? Conflict. Can I go home? Character? Some things about living still weren't quite right, though. April, for instance, still drove people crazy by not being springtime. And it was in that clammy month that the HG men took George and Hazel Bergeron's 14-year-old son, Harrison, away. So again, we have George, Hazel Bergeron, Harrison. We have more characters. And I actually forgot one at the top, which is 2081. We have setting. It was tragic, all right, but George and Hazel couldn't think about it very hard. Hazel had a perfectly average intelligence, which meant she couldn't think about anything except in short bursts. Did you circle Hazel? Hazel. Yes. So, couldn't think about anything except in short bursts. I'm going to underline that, and I'm going to put direct characterization. Because I know that direct characterization is when the author tells me characteristics about a character, and we just the author tells me that about Hazel Bergeron. This is direct characterization. And George, while his intelligence was way above normal, so his intelligence was way above normal. I'm going to write that that's direct as well. Because again, the author is just telling me. 
had a little mental handicap radio in his ear. He was required by law to wear it at all times. It was tuned to a government transmitter. Every 20 seconds or so, the transmitter would send out some sharp noise to keep people like George from taking an unfair advantage of their brains. Wow. George and Hazel were watching television. There were tears on Hazel's cheeks, but she'd forgotten for the moment what they were about. On the television screen were ballerinas. A buzzer sounded in George's head. His thoughts fled in panic like bandits on a burglar alarm. So I'm seeing more conflict here. And I'm going to say it's man versus society. Remember when we talked about society, um, the buzzer in George's head. When we talk about society, we're talking about rules, regulations, laws. And so we can see that this is a very concrete example of George having an issue with the government. Also, I'm going to underline his thoughts fled in panic like bandits from a burglar alarm. And I'm going to write figurative language. Now, that wasn't something that was on the video, but it's something we're going to start talking more about. Figurative language is when there's a sentence that says one thing and means another. It says one thing and means another. Not necessarily sarcasm, but only because that's going to be something else completely when we get there. But it's like when we talk about similes or metaphors. Okay, if I say Jerome is as fast as a cheetah, what the sentence says is that Jerome can run 60 miles an hour. He's as fast as a cheetah. But we understand that to mean what? He's just fast. He's just fast. Says one thing, means another. That was a real pretty dance, that dance they just did, said Hazel. Huh, said George. That dance, it was nice. You guys are going to now read to the bottom of the page. You read the rest of this page. When you do, and I will hand out a piece of paper for you to do your exit slip in one second here, you are going to write me an S-R-E-E -E paragraph explaining how Harrison Bergeron shows one element of a short story. You may only choose an example and an explanation from the second half of the story, so you need to find one. Take a look up here, because I've given you sentence starters. One element the, stor the story shows is, and you're going to tell me one element of short story, right? Everybody besides Jerome? Mm -hmm. Okay. The reason this is an element is because, for example, you'll give me an actual quote from the story, and then you'll tell me what the quote shows, and how that shows an element. Was he the author? No, you only have to choose one from the second portion, second half of this first page. Any so questions? Just one of those really to do his thing before we can read. You're going to read that? Uh -huh. Find an element of the short story. Your exit slip will be this. About what you read. Does that make sense? Okay. My hand is getting swollen in the Let me take a look at you. All right. Go ahead and begin. 